All right. So welcome to another edition of Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Uh, before we get into this, I have to give a quick shout out to Televangel, who uh, provided that music for the new intro. We also have a new outro. I know a lot of people had complained that, uh, you know, it was lacking any uh, kind of professional quality in terms of what we were doing from the the intro and the outro. So shout out to him. I put a link to his band camp in the chat for folks who don't know, um, very talented producer, formerly a member of Blue Sky Black Death production team um, and has a really cool catalog of music you could check out and, you know, purchase in various forms. So um, check that out. Um, so let's get into the conversation. So today I'm really, really excited. Um, we have Steve Saleda with us. I know Steve is not someone who does a lot of public interviews and things like that. And so I'm really honored that he would uh, be willing to come on and, and talk to me and talk to us. Um, for folks who don't know, which you should, Steve Saleda is a teacher or educator and the author of um, author and editor of eight books, I think, in total. Uh, he can correct me on that. I'm wrong if I'm wrong. Um, his written work includes inter slash nationalism decolonizing native america and palestine uncivil rights israel's dead soul and anti-arab racism in the usa where it comes from and what it means um we're going to be talking about pieces that he's published on his website uh which is steve um that's in the show description if folks want to link to that and um, so, yeah, without further ado, Steve, welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. It's great to have you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and I should say you I meant to include this, but you have a memoir that's coming out uh, in March as well um, that I look forward to reading. Um, so, yeah, maybe we can say a little bit about that at the at the at, as we start to wrap up. But um, looking forward to that. Thank you. Um, so, you know, like I've really appreciated a lot of the interventions, you know, I've been following the, the work that you've been putting out. Um, you know, I'm, I've followed your website for a long time, but, um, just especially, um, you know, in recent months now, um, since October 7th, you've put out a number of pieces, all of which I think are important in their own ways. Um, so one of the, I think your most recent piece is this piece, Scrolling Through Genocide. Um, and I think, you know, it, it touches on what's been a really surreal experience um, for, for everyone. You know, you, you talk about this theory that had kind of existed, um, you know, where you say you no longer ascribe to it, but um, that like if the whole world is watching, right, that a genocide cannot unfold, ethnic cleansing can't happen, um, you know, in a digital age where we have so much access to, um, you know, ev events on the ground, images, depictions, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, you discussed this through your own engagement with settler colonial studies and indigenous studies, um, you know, from the context of Turtle Island, which I know you have really worked at this intersection of, you know, Palestine studies, uh, Middle East studies, and then indigenous studies and Native American studies. Um, so I realize, you know, this question is just going to ask you kind of rehash some of what you laid out in that piece already, but say a little bit about that theory and why you think it has been proven incorrect in this case. And, you know, I don't mean that in the sense of like, you know, prove to us that it's incorrect, because I think we can all see that it's incorrect. But I, I'm interested in the sort of dynamics of, you know, the US, Israel, that, you know, have, in, have caused it to be incorrect in this case. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try, of course, the, you know, I started doing work in comparative you know, settler colonization, um, it really, it's, it's been over 25 years now. I, I really started in 1998, 1999, when I was a graduate student. And, you know, there was a, in those days, a lot of comparison of, of you know, Palestinians and, and indigenous peoples in, in North and South America had been done, particularly in activist communities, but it was really kind of a, a new or newish thing in, in, in academe. And, so there was, you know, there was some enthusiasm and excitement 
um, you know, among my advisors and peers at the time, but also some trepidation. And, you know, one thing that, that people kept emphasizing to me was you have to highlight differences in addition to points of comparison. And, and I think that's a good, good practice anytime somebody's doing comparative analysis anyway. But they, they kept saying, um, or, or kind of the going theory was that, well, look, um, you know, natives are being displaced and dispossessed right now in the present, it's still ongoing, but really the the bulk of it, or, or the, the maybe what we would consider the worst part of it happened off camera. It happened when there was no international law. It it happened when, or when international law looked very different. It, um, you know, it, it, it happened when it, it took news a significant amount of time to travel around the world and so forth. And so you have to compare that to, you know, the, the current Zionist project of ethnic cleansing, where it is, it's subject to media scrutiny, it's, it's subject to various international governing bodies, so forth. And so we just don't think that it could, could quite happen in the same way. So I've been thinking a lot of, about that because I, I always kind of bought into the idea that it, it would be next to impossible, you know, for reasons of international scrutiny for, you know, the Zionist entity just to, to, to move 2 million people or 3 million people or 4 million people across the border into another country. And we learned in 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 recent weeks that uh, actually that that's really not as strong a deterrent maybe as we had thought. You know, the deterrent to forcibly transferring Gaza's population, there is an, a, 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 something of an American diplomatic deterrence. Uh, there's an Egyptian deterrent, but um, I, I don't think anybody truly believes listening to Israeli politicians and, and watching the news that such a thing would be unfeasible. Right. You know, there, there's a, there's an idea that, yes, it, it absolutely could happen. We could imagine, as, as horrible as it is, based on how horrible everything has already been, that, you know, the Israeli military is just going to start, you know, uh, slaughtering people wholesale or push them across the border if, if they refuse to go of their own accord. And, um, and, and so I started thinking about, well, what does this mean? Um, it, it, it means, first of all, that the past is is more connected to the present, maybe than than we might have thought, and maybe mm -hmm. to some we're overestimating the, the the power of mass media. We were probably also overestimating the the power of public outrage and international law. Although I, I think probably a lot of people on the left would have been skeptical of international law to begin with, uh, you know, its utility or at least its applicability. Um, well, whatever skepticism we had has been reinforced. And so what 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 then does that tell us about our position as you know you know as beings in this world, as social beings, as political beings, as as consumers of politics and media? And it doesn't, it doesn't tell us anything good. it's 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 demoralizing and disheartening because, as you say, it's it's been surreal watching this type of violence come through on our social media feeds, it coming through in, in news reports, uh, in, in photographs, and just as a, a type or a scale of human destruction that I, I don't think we've, we've yet seen, at least in this century. It's, 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 it's something not unprecedented in human history, but it's unprecedented, I think, in the social media age. And it's, been absolutely horrible to witness and part of the reason that it's been horrible to witness is not because our, our fellow human beings are being slaughtered in full view of the world it's the fact that it is happening in full view of the world and we can't really do anything to stop it you know we we can talk about it we can educate people we we can just sort of scream you know at, <laughs> at, at an audience in a, a hope of, of gaining understanding or empathy but we don't have any specific material mechanisms to, to, to do, well, how are we going to pressure the U.S. government? Okay, we can keep writing our Congress people. They're not going to listen. They don't listen. You know, what the hell is Joe Biden going to do? We, we you know, we can camp out at the, at the White House and people have been protesting all over the place. And the political class just ignores the protests. You know, cumulatively, millions and millions and millions of people on the streets of, uh, in capitals of the metropole you know, uh, public opinion polls, uh, you know, even in Western countries showing uh, great levels of support for a ceasefire and then the political class 
in various countries, you know, just ignores it. And then there's no consequence for ignoring it. It's like, it's, it's forcing us to think about what our very notion of, of civic or political engagement can even be in this day and age, that we're, we're powerless to stop a genocide, even while we are being made witness to a, a genocide with uh, modes of, of information that are, are, are very recent, that, that previous generations didn't have access to. And so in a sense that it makes it easier to understand what's going on, but it makes it much more difficult to witness because we get to see precisely what it is that we're unable to stop. Yeah. Um, I mean, what do you think in regard to that, though? I mean, so I, I agree and I want to get into more of this discussion of of civic engagement and electoralism, too, because you've written about this as well. Um, but I also think like. You know, the tactics that inspire me in some sense in these times is like, you know, uh, Yemen, you know, taking, you know, stopping ships. Right. Or um, even in the U.S. context, even though um, these things have been less successful so far you know, attempts to stop things at the ports, um, you know, in the UK and in the US, there's some efforts around, you know, shutting down Elbit, these kinds of things. I mean, do you think, though, that like um, a practice that is more engaged with the material mechanisms of this slaughter as opposed to um, the kind of appeal to, uh, you know, the benevolence of authority it, is more where we should be focusing our efforts um, to whatever extent that we we can. I do. I can't these days um, in, in my middle age, I can't rightly call myself an, an activist. So I, I feel a little bit, uh, you know, in not much of a position to be uh, lecturing anybody about tactics but yes mm -hmm. direct action is is the most viable form of engagement what what the folks in very courageous folks in in palestine action in the uk are doing is is tremendous it comes at a tremendous cost these dis disruptions um spark the uh you know the authoritarianism of of the state and so people are putting a lot on the line you know the Organized labor has, has played an important role, shutting down the ports, um, you know, all of these things are important. And then I, I think for uh, maybe people who are working in, in the arena of, of ideas or in cultural context, I, I think, yes, it's important to highlight these forms of engagement as a, a, a way, I think, to, to, to people... I guess to direct their energy into something that they feel can can make an actual difference, and not it, no one action or event, of course, is going to change the course of of U.S. policy. But cumulatively, they do make a difference and they do make an impact. But it requires a a, a lot of human power. It requires a, a lot of of bodies. It requires a, a lot of organization. In some cases, it requires a, a a lot of funding. And so I think from where I'm I'm positioned as as somebody really who who spends all his his time, you know, like just reading and writing at at at, at this point. Um I I I I I do want to make a compelling rhetorical case. Uh, a persuasive rhetorical case for the importance of disrupting, you know, the mechanisms of uh, the political mechanisms by which uh, or through which this this kind of genocide is allowed to occur, and then defending them. A lot of people, you know, like to, you know, scold about this tactic or that tactic and 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 I, I think people are putting their their bodies on the line when they're putting their freedom on the line it's it's important you know for us in whatever intellectual arena that that, that we're working in cultural arena to defend them and and you know maybe to you know save the 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 impulse to to finger wag for a different time or maybe for a private conversation yeah no i i agree with that um so i let's continue on this discussion um, of kind of the civic arena and electoralism. You know, you have this piece that you've written um, 
I think it's genocide Joe and the electoralists. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to delve into this a bit. Uh, it's been particularly egregious to watch all the, well, there's, there's multiple levels of egregiousness, but like one of the levels of egregiousness is the kind of influencer crowd, right? So these blue check, you know, TikTokers, Twitter users, IG people who, you know, have their short like three minute rant on you know oh what you know joe biden's committing a little genocide i mean there's people who have parodied it parodied this that i think it actually is difficult to parody in some se sense because they're just very much saying like you know what do you want to bring back trump you know is basically all that they sort of have in the toolkit and they can't even really articulate what it is about Trump that they imagine to be more evil than what is actually unfolding in front of our eyes right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't say that out of any <laughs> respect or belief or you know, support in any way of Donald Trump. Fuck him. But, you know, I, just to say like that, that is the that's the only message that we have. And it's kind of wild to watch that playing out like we're a full year still away from an election. And there's a genocide going on right now. And so rather than, you know, uh, these people putting some effort into trying to move the needle a little bit, you know, it's just sort of like already this defensive posture um, that's that that comes right up. And so, um, you know, uh, one of the things that you lay out is that, you know, you have this. Um, it's an argument, actually, that, you know, I I, I have a comrade, Brooke Terpstra, out in Oakland, and, you know, he um, will talk about how there's this emphasis always in, especially the nonprofit world and other political elements around civic engagement as an arena of organizing and struggle, right? And his argument has always been for that we need to actually increase the level of civic disengagement, that we need more people to sort of disengage from these arenas and, you know, organize and, and work in other arenas and other ways. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I, hopefully we can have him on at some point to lay out his argument a little bit because I'm not doing it a good service right now, but it reminds me a little bit of that. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess just sort of talk about your own posture at this point. Um, I mean, I think going back and reading through some of your work, it's not really a new posture for you in a lot of respects, I don't think, but maybe more, um, maybe heightened by the contradictions of this moment. But yeah, go ahead. Thanks. I mean, you 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 do a, a fine job of really explaining the you know, the, the the sentiment or maybe even the 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 sensibility but I, I i i would love to hear from you know your comrade out in 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 oakland we 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 probably are on the same general wavelength so i i honestly i don't want to say that <laughs> the um the, the 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 people that are you know trying to compel us to vote for biden or just the the worst kind of mealy mouth bootlickers i have nothing but contempt for them i i think really that that's the only response that they're worthy of and it's difficult sometimes to look past that very visceral feeling of contempt and you know move the problem into an analytical space but i i we have to get past the contempt and into the analytical space and that's what i tried to do with that short piece and what does it mean that amidst a genocide that we're being disciplined into voting for the genocide air okay that's not just a failure of the moral imagination it's a, a, a profound failure, really, of the political imagination. And I would argue, I think probably most importantly, a profound failure of the historical imagination. These are people who have been conditioned to think of voting as, you know, 
the pinnacle of civic life. And maybe in a sense in the United States, they're right, because it's always been pitched to us as, as the pinnacle of, of civic life, like the, you know, a noble form of democratic um, engagement. And so, yes, I, I would agree that some form of disengagement is important, if only to get us in a different headspace than electoralism. There's a genocide going on. Why the hell are you worried about a presidential election? You know, this country has 330 million people in it that we know of, you know, probably more human beings inside of it than citizens. And, you know, you're worried about these, these two 80-year-old creeps. You know, uh, we get to choose between one of them. That's, 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 that's what the choice comes down to, you know, in, in, a, in a country this size, um, you know, and it's not even about choice. How does it even happen? Well, it happens because there are thousands of mechanisms in place that make sure that this is the outcome. And so by the time we get to the point of voting, the issue has already been settled. You know, there is no dissentient candidate. There is there is no real alternative on offer. And you think for me, you could think of disengagement, you know, as, as a, a type of civil disobedience, but I like to think of it in, in terms of a, a term that I, I've been using for years, uh, probably to the point of cliche now, but uh, a recalcitrance. And and I, and I wanted to, before I forget, give a, a, a shout out to the good folks at uh, the Good Shepherd Collective um, in, in Palestine. They, they, they've really been writing a, a, light of, a lot of important stuff in recent years about uh, sort of this this NGO complex that you're talking about and how they're they're funneling so much of the energy of the Palestine solidarity community in, in, into these uh, democratic spaces, these spaces filled with astroturf, et cetera. But um, it, with recalcitrance, it's 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 sort of a, a refusal. I was saying I'm, I'm not going to participate in this process because I think it's a sham. And the response normally is, uh, you know, the normative response is that, well, you know, well, then fine, then you're ceding that that territory to the evil forces altogether. And I don't know, I don't see it that way. I, I, I see it as as trying to exist in a, a different space, a space where community is actually possible, a more loving space, a more compassionate space, uh, a more affirming space, a space where I, I feel like I, I, I can love and and be loved by human beings who share the same broad vision for the future that that I do. And if disengaging from these normative political spaces, which are are avaricious and fundamentally transactional, right, in, into spaces where our, our humanity is 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 being mutually affirmed and where we're able to, I, I guess, discuss actual possibilities for the future that that go beyond the dull bromides of U.S. exceptionalism, then I, I think that's an important move for people, if only on a personal level. But um, if, if you can give me a second, uh, there's always an example that that I go to that's been um, relevant recently. I was thinking about it uh, when you invited me to to come on to to the program. An invitation, by the way, for which I'm 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 really honored and grateful. But um, once you get electoralism in 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 your mind as a, a a project that can be transformative or even revolutionary in in the United States, and there are all kinds of of pratfalls that you end up ignoring, and those pratfalls always come back to bite you. And I'm thinking, of course, of Bernie Sanders, uh, who's become a full-throated supporter of the current Zionist genocide. Um, I, I don't want to relitigate um, arguments of the past, but I, I, there's one thing I want to point to in a, in a friendly way, or maybe a, a comradely way, that there were people in the Palestine solidarity community all the way back in 2015 who were pointing out that, look, the guy's a Zionist. I'm not telling you not to vote for him or or not to support him. You do what you want, but it's important for us to talk about. We 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 can't just brush this aside and keep deploying Palestine as as you know a, a mechanism to get this guy elected. Don't quit beautifying uh, you know the, uh, Sanders through the issue of, of of Palestine. Accept him or reject him based on on what he is. And then, of course, those appeals were in typical electoralist fashion because uh, you can't have really any real dissent to electoralism. Otherwise, it becomes something of a political monster. You know, those critiques got shouted down or they got ignored, you know. Um, well, fast forward eight years later, right? 
I, I hope now people can see why it, in fact, did matter that he's a Zionist, right? You, you, you can't be positioned as a Zionist, right? And, and, and then not take Israel's side in its moment, uh, or what it considers its moment of existential reckoning. He left himself no other choice, and he had made it clear from the outset that this was going to be his choice if it came down to this. And so now what? Everybody is is furious with Sanders for, for a good reason. And I joined them in in, in, in their fury and I affirmed their, their, their fury and their rage and, and, and their anger. But we cannot do the same bullshit next time. When somebody announces themselves as a, a fundamental supporter of Israel or as a Zionist, you cannot just brush that aside and say we're going to educate him or or we're going to keep him in check or you know we're we're going to hold him accountable. You know, accountability is the biggest load of horse shit in 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 the, the entire U.S. political lexicon, right? It 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 doesn't mean anything a and b. It's never ever happened, but. Um, and so now what? What are we dealing with? We, we're dealing with a, a whole lot of wasted energy. We're dealing with a whole lot of disappointment. We're dealing with no viable mechanism to communicate with the U.S. government, with U.S. policymakers, because we don't have any allies right, in that entire institution. And so next time, you have to be more circumspect. I'm not, I don't like to tell people, you know, whether to vote or don't vote, do whatever the fuck you want. I don't care. Support whoever you want. But you have to be serious about it. You, you, you can't brush aside people's stated ideological commitments and then expect them to act outside of the boundaries of their stated ideology when the time comes to act. And this is what electoralism does to people. It's, 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 a, it's a kind of, it's a mechanism to which they constantly trick themselves, Charlie Brown style, you know, in, in, into thinking that they, they, they have a sort of power, right? through the representative that they don't actually possess, that the representative right, into, into whom they're, they're sort of subsuming their power, right, uh, is actually acting independently of their opinion. They're, they're, they're essentially meaningless. And, and I mean, we have to reckon with that. And there are different ways to reckon with it. But, um, you know, th th this, you know, as somebody who's been interested in Palestine my whole life, I've seen it over and over and over again. I, I, mm -hmm. I would love to find the U.S. politician that doesn't at some point throw Palestine under the bus. You know, until I see mm -hmm. it, then I, I'm, I'm forced to continue believing that, that you know, we do need to to disengage from from this this fantasy that, uh, you know, using the uh, the parliamentary system of an imperial state is is somehow going to produce an outcome that makes a meaningful difference in the lives of Palestinians. Yeah, I'm sorry for the rant. I, no, no, I love the rant. Um, appreciate it. I mean, it was funny because in some respect, like, you know, I had been playing for a while of like whether we should invite Cornell West on and this sort of thing, and you know, and then right after October seventh, he comes out with this like really like both sides -y kind of statement we have to mm -hmm. condemn this violence and that violence and this and that and you know it was just like i was like yeah there i mean you know and i'm not somebody i mean you probably know this having listened to mm -hmm. josh and i over the years like you know we're not people who are believers in u.s electoral politics um but even it feels i mean even the idea of like a protest vote you know it's like well you know if what are we protesting supporting somebody who's still very wishy-washy on you know this issue and and yeah. and ultimately when it came down to it right you know they, they're not willing to disavow zionism and you know the, the settler colonial project uh and i think this you know i mean this connects to your other work because right the the settler colonial project of of israel and the settler colonial project of the united states like they are so uh historically currently interconnected i mean obviously we see it, you know on full display the contradictions right now of like you know the u.s you know having a blank check for weapons but then also like oh we'll just ship you weapons without reporting it or we'll just here here's some white phosphorus for you to use i mean like all of these things are are just sort of coming out and being exposed right now and um, you know, to a degree where you actually have 
you know, many institutions and, and governments basically just saying like, look, Israel's the 51st state. Like, I mean, that's kind of the way that it, it feels in a certain respect right now. Um, you know, that's a rant of my own. I don't know if you want to say anything in response to that. But um, yeah, that's that's kind of the way I feel about that situation right now. No, um, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. We're on the same wavelength. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. I do want to shout out a couple of things. So uh, Laura Kilani shouted you out from the Good Shepherd Collective thanking you for the shout out and also me for putting this together. Um, also shout out to Brooke from uh, Oakland Abolition and Solidarity. Um, other folks in the chat, thank you all. Um, and thank you for the, the contribution um, as well. Um, yeah, so let's continue on. I mean, I think that one of the pieces, so I want to talk about your piece, Hamas is a figment of your imagination. I, I really enjoyed you know, as much as we can enjoy anything in these times, like it, this was a this was a great read. And, um, you know, you, you write in it, quote, Hamas is one of the most complex formations of the past few decades. We know it exists by the rockets streaking through the nighttime sky, the soldiers adorned with green headbands, the theatrical de destruction of Merkava tanks. It has a leadership a command structure, a stash of weapons, a rank and file. It offers policy proposals and position papers. It negotiates with various state actors. Yet popular understanding of Hamas largely derives from its apocryphal position in the colonial imagination. The settler has transformed Hamas into a manifestation of his own paranoia and violence. Um, you go on to write, Zionists are terrified of both Hamas and the idea of Hamas. In turn, they transfer uh, responsibility for their barbarism onto the victim, end quote. And so um, that's just a specific passage. This piece really kind of lays out um, the many ways in which, um, you know, we look at the way that Hamas is being, you know, used in this current moment as a kind of rhetorical device, as a, as a, um, as you say, this it, it plays on this imagination, you know, um, and, um, you know, there's interesting things because I think even within the left, uh, even within, you know, the various groups and formations that, that comprise the, the Western left, you do see a number of pieces that have come out that also, um, even in expressing some form of, uh, I won't call it solidarity, right? But some form of um, uh, sympathy, I guess you could say, right? With Palestinians. And there, there's like a desire to um, either, you know, work within some politics of condemnation of Hamas and or like suggest that we have to sort of, we need to wait or we need to support some alternative to Hamas, which is not like a real political force that you know it, you know it's it's again pushing it off to some sort of future yes. rather than dealing with the current moment um and so you know this demand of course that palestinians condemn hamas has this lo much longer history now it's been going on for a long time that this is sort of precondition to palestinians for being able to actually even talk about you know what's going on you know and 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 you know analysts and and, and whatnot. And so um, what what are the functions that you think um, this all serves? Uh, you know, what are what maybe say through a little bit of what you're talking through in this essay? Yeah, it's, you know, it's it, it's a complicated topic and I, I don't trust myself not to uh, ramble into, uh, you know, a half dozen different directions without, uh, you know, any coherent outcome, but I, I, I'm going to try. It's, you know, I, I thought Ramble, about it before. Ra ra rambling is welcome, so feel free to ramble. Okay, <laughs> that's, okay. Right. that's good to know. Um, it's, you know, first of all, you know, we have to, to to think about the different ways that Hamas is is positioned in the political discourse in 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 let's say in both the Arab world and the West. But let's stick with the West. Um, and on the one hand, 
it gets discussed as a political formation, but more often it's it's something of a rhetorical tool that supporters of Israel use to mystify any type of Israeli violence. And so it, it maybe ties back into the point of mass media and everything existing on camera now or everything being reported in, in real time. So, you know, Israel cannot, plausibly deny, for example, that it just bombed a school, you know, or that that it uh, you know, it, it, it stormed a, a hospital and, and and rounded up all of its its medical staff or, or, or did some other horrible thing because it's on camera. We have the testimony of of the doctors. We we have videos of the bodies of the children. I and mean, this is where a rhetorical formation such as Hamas comes comes into play. Well, you know, well, yes, we did that to this hospital or to this school, but that's because there's a Hamas bunker or it's a Hamas command center. And and so in in that sense, Hamas becomes something unreal, right? Uh and and something as a, a projection of the Israeli psyche. And they end up transposing onto Hamas the kind of barbarity in which they are engaged. So it, it plays that role. It, and it, they think that, rightly, that it plays well to a Western audience. That's why they keep trying to conflate Hamas with, with ISIS, for example. Um, and, and, you know, uh, our friend uh, Louis Alte wrote, wrote a good piece uh, a few weeks ago last month uh, t- talking about why the Hamas-ISIS connection is just just cynical and and terrible and just stupid but uh anyhow it's on electronic intifada which everybody should visit and read anyway but um so so there's that it, but there's also a fundamental misunderstanding let's let's move to uh what, what we would call the the, the western left uh, broadly defined uh, a fundamental fundamental misunderstanding or, or misapprehension of palestinian society and the means of resistance that are available to Palestinians writ large, but let's say particularly Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, which is a, a unique situation. Um, you know, the, the West Bank is suffering terribly as well, and the, the West Bank has its forms of resistance, and, and some of them look very much like the type of resistance we see from the Gaza Strip, but, but some of the, the resistance from the Gaza Strip is specific to the Gaza Strip, specific to its geography, specific to its economic position, uh, specific to its location, etc. And Hamas is a capable fighting force. And I'm, I'm going to leave aside the, uh, any conversation about the, you know, the, the ethics of, of its tactics or, or, or whatever. The fact of the matter is, along with the, the PFLP, and Islamic Jihad, who who work together on resistance, along with smaller groups. So those are the three major groups in the Gaza Strip. They are a capable fighting force. And when a lot of Western leftists talk about, well, okay, you know, Judith Butler did this in her essay, right? We 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 need to envision a future for Palestine in which Hamas ceases to exist. This is not going to land right on the ears of of Palestinians. All right. Uh, Palestinians have a variety of ideological commitments. All right. Uh, you know, people who in their own space, in their own time, or, or maybe not supporters of Hamas or who maybe are supporters of Hamas. But what a Palestinian who's familiar with Palestinian society right, and the available options to Palestinians for resistance is going to hear is that we want to declaw Palestinian resistance altogether. We want to get rid of it. Uh, you know, we, we we want to wipe it out. And, and then maybe that's the point in some cases. I don't know, but uh, I, I don't always get the sense that that's the point. I get the sense that people are, are, are sometimes working in a utopian vision of of of, right. of Palestine, where you know it it they, they it ends up looking like what 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 they think Berkeley is. I, I don't know, but um, <laughs> it it's it's a way. It's very often sounds to us of not taking seriously the deterrence capabilities of Palestinian resistance, which is much needed when a population of over 2 million people or 
encaged and under siege and and basically sitting docks for you know Israeli aggression for corporations to test weapons for the state to to test surveillance technology there needs to be some sort of deterrence capability and and Hamas and other resistance groups with whom they work provide that and I, I think to to overlook that is a political mistake and sometimes unwittingly sometimes not I I, I think a form of political insensitivity and another thing we have going on, if 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 you'll humor me for another second, I I absolutely I, I deeply appreciate your patience. But uh, the a future without Hamas is also going to sound to a lot of Palestinians as a future that we don't get to decide. Again, this is among people who, who might support the party or, or not support the party, but it's it sounds to us, at least implicitly, like a lot of lecturing from the Western world about what type of governing mechanism needs to be put in place, uh, what type of political parties ought to exist, what type of, of social policy ought to be enacted, et cetera, et cetera. And those things are in great debate and in great contest in, in most cases among Palestinians themselves living in Palestine or, or those in, in diaspora with, with a close connection to Palestine. Those are issues that Palestinian society will have to work out when the time comes for them to be worked out. But now when Hamas is functioning as the only capable deterrent force in the Gaza Strip is not the time to have that to to work out those issues and all Palestinians are aware that we're going to have to work out these issues and maybe the the process of working out those issues is going to be ugly and and, and create some conflict and create the, uh, some really deep disagreement but right now we're not having that conversation we're trying to survive we're trying to live we're trying to get to the point where we can physically see an independent state, which may or may not have Hamas right, in, 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 in the first place. And ain't nobody invited you into this conversation. This is not a conversation for you to have. It's 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 none of your fucking business. You <laughs> no. know, uh, Mr. PhD, Mrs. PhD from, you know, a fancy American university, you know, to be telling Palestinians uh, what 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 type of political party they should have now or upon liberation they make those choices all right uh hope uh, optimally don't make the choice themselves and it won't be imposed on them in a neo-colonial situation as as you know what happened in south africa and, and, and algeria and other places right optimally they'll get to make the choice and 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 make their own mistakes or have their own successes but it's not going to be mediated through western academe western academe has shit all fuck all to contribute to <laughs> a post-liberation Palestinian political project. They need to get that through their heads already. So right now, you, you, you're going to be lecturing them as, as, as they're, they're being bombed, uh, white phosphorus raining on them. All this horrible shit is happening. They're being genocided. You know, do, step aside. They, they're worried about these things too. I promise you they're worried about these things as the people who are actually going to live with the outcome of their liberation or of their ultimate displacement. They are concerned about these things. They care about these things. And they know that there's going to be a time to have those conversations. And then finally about the, you know, the condemning Hamas. I mean, I got a lot to say about this, but you know what it reminds me of? And I, I think that this will resonate with you, I, knowing where your, your, you know, a lot of your political sensibilities, uh, Jared, are, 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 are located in, 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 in sort of, uh, you know, black resistance, black uprising, black liberation, et, et, et cetera. And, and I know you, you all have on, on this pod done some really tremendous work around that issue. It, it reminds me to some degree, discursively anyway, of the appeal to black writers and thinkers and, and activists to condemn Farrakhan as a, a, mm -hmm. a means to getting access in, into civic life, right? That, mm -hmm. that, you know, you need to condemn black anti-Semitism. You need to condemn this, this, this uh, black public figure, that black public figure, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I know there are a lot of people are, are hesitant to do it right a lot of palestinians right even those who aren't ideologically inclined to hamas uh, don't want to do it and and maybe part of it is for the reason that i just said but part of it is a matter of simple principle 
you are in no moral position, white liberal, to ask a, 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 a black person about structural violence, right? To, to be assuaged by the subjects of your racism. And for Palestinians, it's a similar thing. You, you Zionists are in no position to ask me to condemn any form of violence. So will I condemn Hamas just to satisfy your predilections? No, I won't. Why won't I? Because fuck you, that's why. I'm, I'm not I, 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 I'm not tap dancing to, to your ideological preferences on principle. Whether I like Hamas or don't like Hamas, A, is none of your business, and B, it's not your position, it's not your place to ask me to disavow an important segment of Palestinian society while everybody in that society is currently suffering a genocide. What you need to do first and foremost is condemn your own government, the one that you're supporting, and you're pretending that you're not, but you are, even asking me to condemn Hamas, I already know that I got a liberal Zionist on my hand, no matter how they self-identify. It's a dead giveaway every single time, right? So why don't you condemn Zionism? I want to hear you condemn Zionism, disavow Zionism, before you ever fix your mouth to ask me to condemn any aspect of, of Palestinian society. I, I need that. Just It's the same thing with the anti-Semitism debate. It's like, you no. I need you to disavow yourself of anti-Arab racism before we even begin to have this conversation. Don't, don't be asking me right, to, to distance myself from, from um, racism, a racism which I've never expressed, by the way, when you yourself have built your entire political ideology right, around a form of structural racism that's having these terrible consequences that we're witnessing in real time. So you start with the con condemnation right, of, of your own political positionality, right, and then we'll take it from there. I think that's exactly right. Uh, you're getting a lot of shout outs in the chat for that, that, uh, that, you know, everything you just laid out. Um, I want to uplift this too, because this is something I've thought about a lot amid all of this, you know, too, is like, you know, I, I look, I think that, um, the actual history, right. Of socialist states supporting self-determination is a, is a little bit checkered. There's, you know, some some good examples of it, some parts where maybe we go back and critique and say, well, that wasn't really a very good um, defense of self-determination there, so on. But the principle of it, I think, is very important for us to go back to, you know, because Lenin was quite clear himself that, you know, a nation has the right to determine what type of politics that it has. And even we had this conversation recently uh, I'll be coming out in a little bit with uh, with Eugene Perrier on the Black Belt thesis. But even in the in the sort of U.S. context, right, the Black Belt thesis was also contingent upon an understanding that if black people chose not to have a socialist state, that that was uh, that was OK. It wasn't the thing that the communists were going to advocate for. Right. But they weren't going to place a contingency upon their advocacy of self-determination on the outcome being exactly what they wanted. And I think that that's similar in terms of, you know, I know we're in different contexts. I know we don't have uh, an international communist body that is um, supporting this principle or something like that. But I think as people on the left, that that principle of self-determination is, is very important. Um, the idea that you know, we can't wait for this idealized version. We can't say, oh, we're only going to support Palestinians if we think that the Palestinian state is going to be socialist or we think that, you know, the PFLP or whatever people's preferred Palestinian political orientation might be. That's like you said, it's not up for us to decide. And I mean, I agree, you, you know, talk to yourself, but talk to any range of Palestinians a lot of people in Palestine are critical of a range of the political parties and perspectives. And, you know, that doesn't mean that, you know, and I think we we can listen to those. We can learn from them. We can understand more about kind of the internal politics in Palestine. I think that's important, too. 
but to think that we can impose yeah it can't be that you know people can't be allowed to choose that you know they can't be allowed to have be represented by that or to you know it it's it's quite absurd you know i mean it, it's hard to think of um i i think it's really kind of a long retreat of uh, a politics of of self determination that have produced um a kind of politics where we think no actually you don't have self determination you you i want your freedom on my my idealistic terms <laughs> yes, yes. you know yeah so yeah um yeah. and then they want um you know i think part of it stems from this desire for the the perfect victim an innocent victim you know in a sense a victim without uh agency or a, a victim who's uh, uh, amenable to the the patronage of uh you know an outside more enlightened benefactor yeah no absolutely absolutely yeah i mean it, anyway we, we we've made the point i think um so i i want to go to um so one more of your piece, and this was one of the pieces that you wrote. Um, it was the first piece that you wrote uh, post October 7th. Um, so it was about 12 days after that you published this. So it was a practical appraisal of Fal Palestinian violence. Um, you know, it's a beautiful essay in many ways. Um, and it came at a time when there were so many of these kind of bankrupt reflections from Western intellectuals. You started by talking about uh, your time many years ago uh, at a refugee camp in Lebanon. Um, I'm just going to quote a brief section here. Um, you know, you you talk about witnessing the kind of jubilation of the people in the refugee camp. Um, hang on one second. All right. Um, as they responded to martyrdom operations. Um, in time, you say you came to understand that the jubilation was largely an expression of hope. And a simple hope that the deeply, a, a simple hope, um, and a simple hope at that, the deeply human desire to return home. Every operation against the colonizer represented a possibility of return. The Palestinians were looking at the situation through an abs, they weren't looking at the situation through an abstract or idealistic lens. They were consummately practical. Nobody wanted to live in a refugee camp anymore. And, you know, I haven't had th these experiences like you had, um, you know, or spent time there, uh, you know, but I've always been um, in some ways in awe of kind of how clearly Palestinians understand their struggle. I think this is because in the West, we have a we tend to have a lot <laughs> of ideological confusion, uh, you know, confusion about how, you know, what exactly it is, I think, that that we're fighting for. And there's a lot of different visions of this. Um, and that's not to say I know that there are different visions within the Palestinian context. And there's many, you know, we just talked about kind of disagreements, you know, factions, parties, points of view, of course. Um, but there is a kind of unified understanding around a larger sort of goal or, or purpose, um, which, as you say, is, is relatively simple, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you're laying some of that out in the piece. And um you know, we're watching, obviously, as we've talked about this, this widespread, you know, this genocide that's going on, it's widespread ethnic cleansing, which Israel is seeking to, you know, to kind of complete, it seems like, especially with regard to Gaza. I don't know, you know, there's many people in the West Bank who are also very worried about the events that are unfolding there. Um, and, you know, we've seen over a million people that have been displaced from their homes, um, you know, and this is a displacement of people who are already displaced, you know, and despite all of that, um, you know, uh, this can't desert, it doesn't destroy the, the resolve, of course, of Palestinians to return, to reclaim what is rightfully theirs. Um, and there's this very difficult, I think, emotional or psychological balancing act we've talked about a little bit on this podcast, just in terms of kind of um, you know, that there's optimism that is produced by the resistance and the capacity of the resistance in this time. Um, and it's but then there's also this despair at just sort of how uh, depraved and genocidal Israel's response is. And so, uh, yeah, I'm just interested in kind of where you're at in making sense of this, you know, kind of two months in. And, and yeah, so, yeah. 
Thank you. You 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 frame it really well. It, it's sometimes volatile mixture of of optimism and and despair and we obviously we're we're you know so many of us are are, are taking our 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 cue from you know the 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 folks who are suffering these these horrors but it's always been in a way for colonized people or for oppressed people, the, the greatest form of resistance is, is to not lose their vision for for freedom, because that's what the oppressor, what the colonizer always tries to take away first. Um, and I've thought a lot about it in, in the context of, of my meager life. And, you know, I, we, we all want to leave something meaningful behind or, or contribute something meaningful to to the world and and i think very often people are contributing wonderfully meaningful things to the world you know very often without knowing it and and i, and I wish they did know it but I, I think in my writing uh my political work to, you know to the degree that 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 i ever get an opportunity to to organize with actual human beings anymore i i if it's critical to keep alive the idea of freedom and we might not see a completely free Palestine in, in my lifetime. It partly depends on how much my uh, dietary habits uh, catch up to me, um, <laughs> or when they catch up to me, I should say. But uh, if I quit smoking, maybe it'll it'll uh, you know it'll increase the 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 chances of by a few years. But anyway, um, you know. But if, if we don't, at least I'm going to keep the idea alive because keep the idea alive on our own terms. Not not mediated through the the eyes of the oppressor or through the common sense, the practical wisdom of of the oppressor. Because you know, Gramsci taught us a, a, a lot about the uh, you know the, the 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 problems of dominant notions of of common sense that that they work in in the favor inherently work in the favor of power. Uh, and and so what what's understood to be commonsensical is 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 actually the needs of 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 the, the ruling class being presented to us as, as practical so i'm talking about our own ideas of freedom the ones we fought for and worked for and died for keeping it alive and by keeping it alive you also are keeping alive the material possibility of freedom and that that's really the sensibility that i discern so often from palestine that amid all of this horror and 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 suffering is you know an idea of steadfastness of resistance of defiance of humanity that we're not going to become the monsters that they say we are that we're not going to leave the land or just die you know to make colonization easier for them that we're going to maintain our humanity and we're going to keep the idea alive so that if if I get killed tonight, the idea is going to survive me. And then the idea becomes the inheritance of, of my children and my grandchildren and my descendants, however many generations that it takes. As long as we keep the idea alive, that becomes the inheritance of the next generation. And that really is the um, the central message of of you know, the the now very famous poem of, of the martyr, Rifat, that mm -hmm. that, um, you know, if, if I die, keep the fight alive. If I must die, you know, let let the words outlive me, let the idea outlive me. And, and I really think that that poem um, really kind of perfectly captures or encapsulates what it is that you're saying that, uh, you know, we, we might not survive this ordeal physically we might not even survive this ordeal emotionally right but we will survive the ordeal spiritually and those who come after us will have a mantle to take up a cause to take up and they will have something to build something that that we've left them and, and i think that's one of the most important things that that a person can do whether they're an important intellectual or, or activist or or you know whether there's somebody that the you know who nobody knows about who just likes reading in in the corner of their room in the evening keep the idea of of freedom alive and don't let it be mediated through the pragmatism or the common sense of of the oppressor and in that way we will one day survive the oppression
I yeah, appreciate that. And I appreciate you lifting up uh, Rafat as well, um, you know, very much. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I do, I have a couple of other follow-ups. There's a couple of things I've starred in the chat. So folks, if you have other questions in the chat, go ahead and drop them in and we'll try to get to a couple of things. Um, so one of the things I did want to bring up is that, you know, uh, many years ago now, uh, I, you know, it's funny in prepping for this interview, I knew more of your recent work, but didn't quite realize how much you had written in like the, the first decade of the 2000s and, you know, and, and, and in the early 2010s. And so um, you had a book that was about anti-Arab racism in the U.S. Um, in the years after 9-11, um, you know, and that and in that you made connections to the settler colonial past. And so, you know, I realize I'm going to ask you to, to sort of summarize what was a, a book <laughs> um, in, in a question here. But I'm interested in because we're part of the reason I bring this up is that we're absolutely seeing this again. We're absolutely seeing um, a return domestically um, to the sorts of responses um, that we saw to Arab Americans, to Muslim people in the United States after 9-11. Um, you know, it's interesting in some respects. Maybe there's some differences. I mean, I, it feels like a lot of it is playing out on college campuses in this time, which might have been a little bit different than post 9-11. I don't, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I'm interested in kind of how you're, how you're thinking about that in this frame and anything from that uh, body of research that, that really stood out to you that you wanted to kind of share. Yeah, I would love to. It's, yeah, the book you're talking about it was published in 2006 or 2007. I mean, I was I was I was a pup back then, um, fresh out of uh, grad school and brimming with life. But I'm 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 uh, gratified that that uh, you know somebody still read it. Although I I'd probably be scared to to read it now. So much has changed in in my own mentality and 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 in the world that I I, I wonder if it even has any relevance but um and also like you know like after the illinois fiasco you know I, one thing that that kind of sucked you know among many was that you know like i i wasn't the guy who you know had written about x y and z i was just like the dude who got fired <laughs> like and that that do you know what i mean and it's like no no i mean like okay but i've you know i've done some stuff too other than than you know getting shit canned but uh <laughs> anyway um it, it's what strikes me as i think the major difference first of all one of my theses in in in, in that book uh, is the first book that i ever wrote uh is that zionism is uh, an important driving force of anti-arab racism in in the united states so okay that hasn't changed and that uh it's it's really through the issue of palestine that a lot of anti-arab racism gets articulated tacitly without appearing on the surface to be racist and of course you know i, I i'm learning new ways each day how you know anti-black racism functions in the same way and anti-indigenous racism functions in the same way you know so i you know probably even more insidiously in in, in those other cases but uh you know so where you can say something like um i uh I, I believe in uh, the the right of Jews to have a Jewish majority state. Well, okay, that seems like a you know like a just a regular political proposition. Well, there, there's all kinds of anti-Arab racism, you know, sort of appended to that sentiment that doesn't come to the surface. We have to extract it and we have to dig for it. And I, I think that's the case. That's one way that anti-Arab racism functions through um, you know through through pro-Israel sentiment or through um, a anti-Palestinian sentiment. But now I I would say that you know Islamophobia remains a strong motivation. That is, I, I think people who for whatever reason uh, are, would be considered identifiably Muslim, right? Uh, whether it's because they're wearing a headscarf, a woman, or a, a, a guy is is presented in in such a way as as fulfills some sort of stereotype of of, of the Muslim, you know they they're more likely than you know just uh, you know some rando who happens to be Muslim right <laughs> to uh, you know to to encounter uh, as some sort of violence. But now really it's 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 the Palestinian symbols. 
right? So mm -hmm. it's it's not just uh, you know sort of anti-Palestinianism as the tacit vehicle for anti-Arab racism, but now it's it's become the explicit vehicle for anti-Arab racism, and obviously the most dire example is of the the three young men who who were were shot uh you know uh was it in maine or massachusetts think, somewhere in the northeast i think it, i think it was new hampshire but it, yeah somewhere new, new hampshire, hampshire okay apologies yeah, yeah, yeah. uh-huh yeah. you know who were shot for wearing their kufiyas and then we i just saw a video on on, on twitter a few hours ago of um somebody uh, just identified as a muslim woman who who was harassed um by the spouse of a, a Harvard faculty member for displaying the kafiya, and then, you know, uh, recent uh, in the days following October seventh, we saw the, um, you know, we saw, you know, the the, the woman in the video in, in in New York City put her hands on a child at, at a Palestine demonstration, and so, and so I guess what I'm trying, I'm so long way winded way of saying that now, it's this the objects that are specifically identified with Palestine that seem to be evoking the the worst kind of ire the type of ire that, that people are, are are physically acting on and so if if i were to update that book which i'm, I'm sure needs a, a a ton of updating um i would point to october the 7th as uh as an important moment in uh, a shifting of how this this racism is expressed and it's it's moving uh, from a very broadly defined sort of uh you know uh uh you know uh, islamophobic sensibility into something that's specifically focused on symbols of of palestine national culture real or imagined it's it's in the united states you know and in other places too i suppose it's it's a literal physical hazard you know to wear a kofiya or, or to display a, a, a Palestine flag, and and you know, media and and, and pundits like to frame it as you know, I you know, uh, you know, crazy people acting on on um, you know, acting on some illiberal impulses. But no, it comes out of racism. It comes out of the statements that Joe Biden makes, presenting Palestinians all as rapists and murderers. It, it, it comes mm -hmm. out of this particular condition of genocide and i would argue that it's an extension of the genocide and again you know the you know the the young men god bless them they made that connection explicit in all of their comments after after the shooting that uh, this is an extension of the same genocide this is part and parcel of of the same process so this is one way in which uh, a genocide in in palestine is having very real and devastating um effects on on the us social order yeah um it was actually vermont thank you to the chat for correcting us on that um and i mean it's interesting I, there was a video yesterday i think that i saw that went viral that i believe was in montreal and it was of an unhoused person who was wearing a scarf and this is like the this is the other thing too is it's like there's even there's so much kind of weird paranoia about it that state forces are harassing people because they think it's a cafe right <laughs> and so this is actually and it, we saw some version of this on social media where i think it was a i think it was some adl like goon or whatever was like you know it, it's like they're it's they're they're imagining cafes where they're not actually where it's just a scarf you know it has a little pattern to it or whatever um and so yeah i mean it's kind of a thinking about that level of paranoia and the other thing i would just uplift is that you know, I've talked to some students since October 7th, and the other thing that they've said is that they definitely do feel that students who um, present as Muslim because they wear some version of traditional yeah. Muslim dress, like, are facing heightened harassment and surveillance and so on in these times as well. Um, so, all right. Uh, questions from the chat. So I'm going to pull up a couple things. So... Um, there's a couple of questions. These are kind of connected, so I'll link them together. So one was, um, in your view as a longtime educator, should pro-Palestine undergrad students in the West organize on campus or focus more efforts outside the university? Um, there's a similar question of what role do faculty play and how do or should 
people most effectively intervene in the various universities supporting role in the Zionist project? I think this is a very interesting, both of these are important questions. I think I'm thinking about them in particular in like, you know, that the state has, you know, through the lobbying of uh, the Zionist organizations, they have basically successfully now conflated anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism through U.S. Department of Education policy, which also means that these universities have some sort of, you know, uh, responsibility, quote unquote, to investigate anti-Zionism, essentially, on their campuses um, and to to try to stop it, you know, essentially. Um, and so obviously it's a it's a there's a lot going on on college campuses. But, uh, you know, navigating this is is very um, you know, people are w walking on shaky ground right now, as they always have been. I mean, obviously, you yourself are an example of this. Um, but I think that, you know, that the the example of of your firing and the kind of things that you've been through, I think, uh, you know, is 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 much is is a broad uh, project right now. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, th I thank you, uh, Walter and and Lou, for the, the 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 questions. I'll 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 try my best to provide a you know a, a satisfactory or meaningful response. No, the the fight on campus uh, strikes me as as deeply important and 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 meaningful. Not not simply for the people that are invested in any particular campus community, you know, students and and faculty and otherwise but um you know just in the culture writ large i would say that the university is uh an important site of contestation that that goes beyond its own boundaries mm -hmm. they're extremely hostile places as, as jared points out for for students and faculty and workers and otherwise to, to organize i mean not really not just around the issue of palestine that's the most obvious one but labor rights uh you know all, all kinds of things they're they're really uh becoming at the administrative level uh deeply reactionary places and and the, the donors are getting more and more involved which is which is never a good thing for you know for functional human beings human beings with souls but um right no, you 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 cannot cede the space of campus to the Zionists and to the the reactionaries. Um, it, there's there's too much at stake. Um, if they get their way without any resistance, then um, you know the, there's never ever ever going to be the possibility of of you know a, a functional campus or a functional academic freedom or a, a functional curriculum or you know uh just a, a functional anything on campus any, any 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 aspect of the education that that we hold dear that we hold as important will will cease to exist more or less okay and some of you might say good let the whole university collapse okay then if you want the university to collapse right I, look, i'm not going to knock you right that's that's cool but that this would be one way to do it is is ceding it to uh you know uh, uh zionists and, and all of their uh you know uh you know reactionary uh, uh sponsors and colleagues as to the faculty oh, i got a, i got a lot to say about this but uh here here i, I don't want to move into you know my own version of of finger wagging but i would say primarily among other things it is the role of faculty to defend your students you know defend your fucking students don't leave them at the, the the mercy of outside pressure groups of donors of of administrators none of whom have their best interests in mind you have to have their best interests in mind that is your job that's your obligation that's your responsibility so if they are being so whether you have any whether you even care about palestine or not right they're your students, all right. They're they're on the campus. You need to defend them on 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 principle, from sources of from sites of power that 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 are, are greater than them and that could, that can cause them real harm. Um, 
you know, and not even, it goes beyond the, you know, the old fashioned harm of, you know, like getting expelled or, or, or whatever. Now they can be arrested. They can be prosecuted. They, they can be turned over to, to the state. Uh, they can be deported. Um, and, so, and so faculty need to first and foremost defend their students. Second of all, and I guess this is just as important, um, speak against their own colleagues. You know their own reactionary colleagues who are making uh, uh, the, the campus a, a living hell for everybody else. You know you don't have to raise your voice publicly. You you don't have to get in the middle of campus with a soapbox and and a microphone. But in the spaces in which you work and in which you have influence, you need to maintain some semblance of of sanity in your little corner of of the campus and make sure that people aren't promoting or enacting policies that are causing harm to your colleagues, that are causing harm to students, that are causing harm to the, the community. You can speak against them. Um, you, you, you know, yes, it's it's okay to be scared. It's normal to be scared. It's, it's, it's wise to be scared. But at the same time, in a time like this, in, in a moment like this, this is, this is not a moment for bashfulness or or to punt on it you need to draw a line and you need to hold firmly to that line because real harm is being done in some cases irreversible harm right to your students to your colleagues to your workers to your community members and they need anybody with any modicum of of institutional power right to stand against this and even if you end up being ignored even if administration runs roughshod over you it's very possible that they will even if you get ignored completely i think it's important at least to try and have your objection registered on the record you know you have to say something i appreciate that and i also you know i mean i've been thinking about this a lot because there's also these dynamics as you well know you know within the academy of like you know, there's tenured faculty, right, who who maybe have a little bit more leeway in terms of what they can say publicly. And then there's people who are on, you know, who are yes. on tenure track or like, you know, contingent sort of faculty, whether this is like lecturers or adjuncts or whatever, um, who very likely will not work again if they say certain things publicly. But yes. yet there is, I think, a decent amount that those folks can can do. And I think sometimes you know, we get very obsessed with the kind of politics of making a statement and saying something publicly, when in fact, there's a lot to be done on the ground. Yes. That does not necessarily yes. mean that you're sticking your neck out and, and going way out on a limb in quite the same ways as making certain statements would be publicly. I don't know how you feel about those dynamics. I, I feel as you do. And and yes, thank you so much for making that distinction. I guess I had in mind, uh, erroneously, uh, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about uh, faculty with some sort of, of institutional power, i.e. tenured faculty. But um, no, that, that you know, the faculty in, in includes all types, you know, all the way from from graduate students to to um, senior scholars. But I would really put a lot of, of contingent faculty and, and precarious faculty and and, um, you know, non tenured, non tenured track faculty among the classes of those who need to some level of protection among their institutional peers. But yes, yeah, some sometimes, again, just to reiterate, you don't need you don't need the soapbox and the microphone. Sometimes it's important, sometimes it's necessary, but uh, that doesn't need to be everybody's mode of of, uh, of being a a good, you know, colleague or a good teacher. I, I've never liked it when when people accuse one another publicly, especially people who don't know each other. You know, well, what have you done for the movement, or what have you done for this, or what have you done for that? It's like, well, you know, you don't know what the fuck they've done or haven't done. You you don't know how to measure their effect. Maybe every single day they're they're making people's lives better among those they come into contact with. You know, their students, their peers, and colleagues in, in in ways that you don't see, in ways that aren't recorded for for the internet, in ways that aren't posted on Instagram, right? And and so I, I think that yes, precisely what you're saying that being a good teacher, a supportive teacher, being a good colleague, um, you know, a supportive colleague, uh, uh, creating an atmosphere where 
it at least makes it slightly easier for for people to survive these terrible times on campuses is a, is a deeply important thing to do. I appreciate that. Um, there's so many people are putting great stuff just in the chat in terms of questions. Um, this question in particular, I wanted to bring up to you because it's something that your work, I think, addresses directly. Um, so this question was, what do you think about Zionists questioning SJP organizations about their positionality as participants of native land dispossession because their school campus is on native land or is on stolen land um, to invalidate calls uh, to shut down a broad campus in Israel. And this is something that uh, for folks who haven't read it, you go into in inter slash nationalism in these, um, you know, dynamics of the fact that in the US, in Canada, in Australia, we are also in context of settler colonialism. And so this gets used as a gotcha a lot by people saying like, oh, you're against settler colonialism, but you're on stolen land right now in this university. And this is something that you have actually spent some time thinking about. So yeah, please. Uh, thanks, Joel, uh, if I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, what do I think about uh, Zionists bringing that up? I, I think that the Zionists who bring it up as Zionists tend to be are full of shit. I don't think that any SJP needs to listen to them. Uh, I, I, let me, if there are any SJP members or, or activists out here listening, um, you know, uh, I'll, my advice is you don't have to listen to them. I, they, have nothing but the worst intentions for you in mind. They don't give a shit about indigenous people or Native Americans. They're using them as a rhetorical cudgel to facilitate support for their own genocide. So you don't, don't, don't worry about it. You do what you need to do. Listen to the people who you need to listen to and keep moving forward. But having said that, yeah, it's of course Im Im important, you know, for us as as Palestinians, as as people really of of any, uh, you know, uh, nationality or, or cultural or, or ethnic background uh, in, in the so-called United States, who's who's not native or or indigenous. This is always important for us to think about our positionality, right, vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, the, the 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 politics and the history of the land that that we're on. And from what I see from SJPs and from young Palestinian students or young pro-Palestinian students is that, you know, most of them spend a great deal of time thinking about it seriously and taking it seriously and and making efforts to be in, in some kind of contact or, or conversation with their um, indigenous brethren. Um, and, and so I, I don't think that Practically speaking, philosophically and morally speaking, the Zionists got no leg to stand on. But I think even practically speaking, I, I don't think the Zionists who are raising that critique have a leg to stand on because, you know, we can all do better, all of us, my, certainly myself. But SJPs, I, I think, are, are doing a, a, a very good job of, you know, reaching out to, to, to you know, to people in, in the Black struggle, in the Indigenous struggle, in, in, in various you know, forms of labor struggle. Um, and or and if they're not doing that, then they, they should, right? They should, you know, it's, it's, it's important for them to do. And so the, the answer for SJPs to that question is ignore them and just keep doing what you're doing, right? They, they, they're, they, they're not serious about Palestine. They're not serious about Native Americans, but you can be serious about Palestine and about uh, Native America. And, Think about your relationship to this land on which you're studying and the way that it might inform your understanding of Palestine, but also more important, inform your understanding of the types of things that you can do as an activist, as somebody who wants to make the world better on, on the very land on, on, on which you stand. What forms of contestation still exist there? What what you know, what what forms of, of indigenous sovereignty or self-determination or or still under threat or are still in contest in, in, in some way. And you can, you can find ways to lend your support to the indigenous peoples, either the students on, on your campus, the faculty on your campus or, or people in, in the surrounding community. It's always important to think about um, 
about where our struggle for Palestinian liberation intersects with or at least has something to contribute for struggles for liberation on on whatever ground we happen to be standing on in the particular moment whether it's it's, it's native american or, or or any other one so this i think the way to undercut that particular critique is by saying yes the united states and canada are colonial powers as well just like israel and yes i support native liberation on their ancestral homelands, just like I do for Palestinians. Next question, I don't wanna talk about it. And then do you think it's an accident? Do you think it's a coincidence that the nation state, uh, the settler colony now, you know, uh, committing a, a massive genocide in, in front of the eyes of the entire world has as its main sponsor, other genocidal settler colonies? in the United States and Canada or other colonial powers like the UK, it's not an accident, it's not a coincidence. So we can make those connections, but you don't have to listen to, 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 to the critiques of, of, of bad faith actors. I would suggest instead listening to what native peoples themselves have to say to you and then starting the conversation from that point. Yeah, I appreciate that. There was a, Actually, another question that was asked that's kind of a quick related follow-up um, to what you had just said, which is what advice do you give students who have some space to organize on campus, but you see them getting very bogged down by impotent little provocations by Zionists on campus where, um, yes, what are maybe better ways for them to direct their energy or how do you how do you think about that? I mean, obviously, it's important, as you said, not to seed all of these spaces of of content contestation, but there is also this very disruptive character that can come about from um, the way that Zionists can relate to uh, pro Palestinian pro Palestinian organizing on campus. Don't let their desires be the point of of your strategy in, in other words if you, you all want to do something if the cp wants to put a, an event or an action together and it 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 runs into uh you know some kind of of, of provocation zionist provocation or you know it gets shut down or, or whatever then pivot to a new one it just pivot just keep on going all right they, they they can't control or occupy all the space think of it metaphorically as in in palestine it's itself they, they can keep building that wall. They can, they can keep stationing people in the watchtowers. They can, they can build that, but they cannot control all the space. And there's always a way for to get your ideas through, through the, through the frontier that they're trying to control. So just be resilient, keep doing it, but don't let fear of their response determine at the outset what it is that you choose to do or not to do based on your own needs, based on the need of the, the Palestinian students and, and the other students in camps, the, the anti-Zionist Jewish students, etc., uh, based on their needs. You come up with your plan, and if they throw a roadblock in there, fine, they're going to do that. Protect yourselves. Don't sacrifice anybody. Don't, don't, don't get yourselves kicked out of school. All right? You're smart. Sit down together, find a way around the roadblock. They put another roadblock up, you find a way around that one. But there's always a way around. And I, and so you 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 don't in the end ever have to be stopped because being on the side of the oppressed means inherently that you're going to have to be more creative and imaginative than the oppressor. And I'm confident that you're up to that task. Right on. Um this was kind of, you know, it's it's a little bit of a different question. It's kind of a geopolitical, you know, or, you know, question. But do you have any thoughts on the nuclear threat that Israel presents uh, in the region? You know, um, obviously, I think that there is a lot of, this is one of the, well, it's discussed in certain spaces, but there's not necessarily a lot of discussion all the time of the potential that this has to break out into a much larger war, um, you know, considering kind of the belligerence of, uh, you know, of, of, his, of the state of Israel, of, of the Zionist entity. Mm. Thank you, Jay. I, I really don't have any, any 
you know, wise words to to say about it. It it does frighten me. I'll 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 confess. I I think it's in the backs of a lot of people's heads that you know there there is this uh, nuclear capability and what that means for the ability of of any sort of resistance to you know to be successful. And I'm going all the way back to you know uh, you know the fateful triangle, which I think Chomsky published in in I want to say eighty three, eighty four. It's I mean it's it's an old book um, even back then. Um, you know he, he was talking about the idea that that um, you know, Israel will, will deploy or potentially or threaten to deploy the, the nuclear option rather than, than concede any significant territory. And so I think about it in that way. Um, how, how is liberation even possible without a kind of mutually assured destruction? I, and so I, I, I just don't know. Um, it, it's very difficult to disarm a, a, a nuclear state. Um, and I, I, I really don't have any, any useful, I don't know what that means geostrategically or, or, or geopolitically. It, it, if anything, I think it, it, it raises the importance of our ability to curtail, you know, uh, Israel's power in, in, in this world, because when we think of all of the possible outcomes that 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 can come of of you know Israel uh, you know acting on 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 its uh, you know its own impulses, all of them are very ugly, you know, and and we want to avoid that ugliness to whatever degree that we can. Yeah, appreciated. I mean, I think. Yeah, I have another question. I'll save it for later, though, because there's a couple of others I want to get to. So, um, you know, question posed about tactics and strategy. You know, there's a lot of different types of things going on, especially, you know, I'm sure that's true everywhere. But in the U.S., there's, you know, marches. Uh, there was a, a proposed kind of general strike on this past Monday. Um, you know, there's obviously folks who have been doing the the work to try to blockade, you know, shipments at ports and things like that. Um, but I think what Ivana is posing here is, you know, some, something of a useful question for us to think with, which is, uh, that, you know, the, the existence of a variety of tactics does not necessarily, um, mean that there's a strategic orientation to all of this. And, and, you know, it, I think that's, that's a tricky thing. I'm not saying it necessarily as a critique because there's a number of different organizations that are involved and a number of them may have their own uh, strategy in mind. Uh, but, um, you know, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ivana, for, for, for tuning in and for the question. Um, I, I, I hesitate to make myself any kind of arbiter about uh, uh, tactics because the, the, the people doing the actual organizing know a, a lot better than I do, um, and 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 I I really don't want to be uh, you know uh, proffering any any sort of um, un unsolicited advice. I, I don't think that that's my place. But a, a general observation is that it, it really depends on. Um, Really, the the location of of the, the the group will will determine a lot about what kind of of tactics that it can use, or what kind of tactics are viable for it. What what type of local government exists there? Um, how do the the police generally behave? Uh, you know, where where are the politicians at? What has happened to people who have tried certain tactics before you? Did they get thrown in jail? Did they lose their jobs? And and so all of this has got to take into account based on the the local tax so I also think that the, the timing is important so there's a general process of just thinking through what seems like the most optimally effective tactic given the context of any particular situation so you have to to make collective decisions about the context of any particular situation so I'm not I'm, I'm not huge for example on just as a general proposition on on you know disrupting talks um, it, that that can be good theater and 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 generally I, I don't oppose it but uh you know i, I would think that disrupting a, a weapon ship and shipment at a port sounds to me more important but i mean if you don't live next to a port then <laughs> like you know if, if right. you're 
in the middle of Indiana or whatever, right? Then, then you know, that option is not available to you. And so maybe you'll get the chance to, to disrupt the talk. But but here's what I mean about timing and context. So when, um, you know, that that uh, hideous uh, genocidaire, uh, Barry Weiss, um, you know, uh, uh, sicked her 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 mob on our beloved martyr uh, Refat. You know, uh, you know she she really uh, just it's just a horrible thing. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, she 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 targeted him for recrimination while he was still alive for a joke that that he had made. And of course, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of of of, of trolls and bad faith actors ended up piling on this man who who was living in the middle of a genocide. Right, just just unconscionable levels of of horridness. But the day after uh, Rafat uh, was martyred, maybe two days after, shortly after, uh, Barry Weiss is giving a talk at the University of Texas, and you know because it's Barry Weiss and because she's exactly the kind of reactionary that state legislatures and university administrators love. Uh, you know, like the president of the University of Texas was there, the, the brass was there basically, and a whole bunch of people disrupted it. Um, they disrupted it, they yelled Rifat's name, they walked out. And that, that struck me as in that moment, in that context as deeply important, right? So that that not not only to to honor the memory of 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 our friend, but to to sort of send a message that you're not going to do this to to one of us. You're not going to do this to one of our martyrs, and 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 you know then peacefully go around the country peddling your bullshit to anybody who will listen. That there's going to be a consequence. It's a peaceful consequence, but this is going to be the consequence. You're you're never going to go out in public again without hearing Rafat's name. He is going to mm -hmm. haunt you forever. So in that sense right the, the, I, I see disruption as as an important tactic i mean will that tactic liberate palestine no but you know that that tactic is going to give us energy and and a sense of purpose and and maybe even a a, a smile from the above but uh you know it, again so I, i'm just yammering now it, it really depends on what's available to you based on circumstance based on on location and based on history you know what 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 worked for the people in your community, um, you know, uh, before and now? What what didn't work for people in your community? Um, how how did uh, you know the the local elite respond to action X versus action Y and 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 these sorts of things? But I would say that that anything is on the table, and it 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 what what you pull off of that table should should be based on what you all think would collectively as as a group will think uh, uh, has the best chance of of being effective based on the, the outcome that you desire. And I, I always advise, uh, this, this always helped me, uh, you know, uh, back when I was younger, that I would start with the outcome. Okay, what's the optical outcome that I want? And then sort of work backwards from there. What's, what action is most likely to get me to this outcome? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, all right, I think... I want to lift up a couple of other things, just folks, you know, um, just shouting out Rifat and um, people very appreciative of your commentary out here. Um, yeah, Rifat wishing he were a freedom fighter so he could die fighting back. I mean, I remember that also on that electronic intifada, um, one of his earliest discussions at the beginning um, and him talking about you know, all I have is this expo marker, but if they come into my house, I'm going to fight them with that, you know? And, uh, yeah. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's amazing. Um, you know, the ways that he's, he's continued, I, I that's been something beautiful that's come obviously from his martyrdom is the way that people have lifted up his words and his work. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that's, it's interesting is that I think a lot of us who work within um, that I feel this way working in spaces like this, I'm sure you will feel this way sometimes working in academia and, you know, cultural workers and stuff like that. Sometimes we can feel like um, our work, you know, is not that important. And I mean, in some sense, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it does come down to, um, you know, as we can see, it comes down to, to weapons and military capabilities and all of these things. But there is a um, an importance to cultural and intellectual work in yes. um, it, it has a connection, I think, to um, 
to this struggle, we can see it, I think, quite specifically, but also to all of our struggles, how we narrate them, how we think about them, um, the the art that people create to lift them up. And so I don't know if you have any any thoughts you want to share on that. And nothing more more lovely than than what you just said that yeah it's that stuff's always going to be Im important to me Im important to us again when it comes to the the physical liberation of you know a, a colony or an oppressed community we we don't always have the, the tools at our disposal to to create that outcome but we have tools we have tools to make life a little bit better and life a little bit happier and life a little bit uh more meaningful and we we should use those tools it's it's a beautiful thing to use those tools and then to be in in community with 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 one another around them and i really it's just i i keep thinking you know uh, jared i was like scrolling twitter earlier today um and you you know how uh, I, I don't know maybe I'm the only one who does this but when somebody uh, you know like a famous liberal Zionist makes a tweet and and then everybody responds I I, I read the responses because they cheer me up <laughs> because they, <laughs> often they're so clever or at least they're 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 affirming and I keep right. seeing the thoughts like responses do you know what I mean like all of a sudden we'll be scrolling and then oh there's Rafat with with the three poop emojis, you know, and, and <laughs> right. it, I, I can't, you know, I can't, it can't wrap my head around that, that he's not physically here with us, but, you know, he's, he is it, little stuff like that. He He's here with us in spirit, but when when he was here with us physically, you know, we, we, we were able to I, I hope provide some measure of of you know relief for him in 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 those very dark moments when when he was living through the genocide and he was able to provide us a ton you know in a tremendous act of 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 generosity through his writing through um you know his 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 lectures through through his poop emojis on twitter <laughs> even <laughs> even those remain even those remain meaningful because they're making a statement you know and yeah. and so yeah i I can't liberate palestine you know uh you know sitting here in, in 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 my living room but it gives me it really does uh i've never like put any of my writing like behind a, a, a paywall i just don't want to i, I understand why people do I, this is no con condemnation or judgment for anybody you all do what you need to do the reason that that i don't is because i, I i'm able to go without one but i it gives me such tremendous joy when somebody finds some sort of meaning in 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 something I wrote. It it makes me feel deeply connected to that person. It makes me feel intimate with that person, and and it makes me feel like I've done at least something, however tiny, useful with my day. Maybe even useful with my life. And so those those forms of of connection are are, are really meaningful, and they're they're made to outlast us. You know, however long it is that we're here, they're 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 made to outlast us, and I think that that's what's so intimate and beautiful about them. Yeah, you said yeah. something, you said something that I. No, oh, hang on one second. Um, yeah, you said something that I I do want to. I think you. I'm trying to remember now where I remember you talking about this, and actually maybe it was related to Muhammad al Kurd, um, and uh, you've I think you've written about um the importance of kind of playful defiance or like m sort of mocking or um you know some of the ridiculousness that you do encounter and i mean i refat obviously makes me think of that you know both in terms of the joke that that barry weiss was making fun of or was not was attacking him over but also um just the poop emojis right and so um you know i don't know if if I feel like that's an important thing as well uh, for us to keep in this because it can be quite dark, you know, and uh, yet I think about that, that sense of humor that Palestinians are able to also practice in relation to that. Uh, it, it is an act of defiance of some mood of, of steadfastness, you know, as well. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts that you want to share on that. Oh, again, not nothing, nothing as 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 well as as you put it. 
Uh, but I agree, the, the, the humor is not just a defense mechanism, but it's a source of resistance. And yes, it's a source of joy. Even, even in this terrible suffering, we, we want to smile. You know, we need to smile. And uh, it's nice to be able to make um, other people smile with a well-timed joke. And if it's a well-timed joke that also happens to really e expose the, the, the idiocy of some Zionist formation, that's all the better. Um, I mean, Muhammad uh, Kurd is, is, he's really good at it. Um, he's, he's really good at it. Uh, I, I really like uh, Ali Abunim's uh, uh, humor. He has a kind of uh, dry, withering humor, but it can be really, really sharp sometimes. And and yeah, so these are the the you know the and Rudafat was he he was excellent at it. So, um, but I think in general, it's it's, it's something you know Palestinians are, are are good at, and it's more than just making you know uh, lemonade out of of lemons. It's a way of it's a way of of surviving. It's a way of 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 defying. It's a it's it's a way really of of just exposing the the absolute inanity uh, and and just surrealness of 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 the situation that they're made to you know to exist in. Right on. Um, this question I hesitate to ask because I think it's kind of an impossible question, but I I'm gonna share it anyways. We'll do it as your kind of final and then if you have any other closing thoughts that you want to add um but i do think that obviously it is important to you know as we've talked to throughout to remember that there is a genocide going on that there is this you know ongoing act of ethnic cleansing and um and we have that and we have the ultimate liberation of palestine that we also uh, hold as you know a goal as an aspiration and so um what are your thoughts on on this on you know kind of uh the question is what do you think is practically and strategically necessary and effective um for both an immediate end to the genocidal escalation and for the ultimate liberation in palestine again i acknowledge this is an impossible question to answer <laughs> yeah it is um i think cv i mean it's 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 a good question it's just a difficult question and i and i, and I reckon that you know the fact of its difficulty is what makes it good, and I, I know it's on a lot of people's minds. I this I'm not um, I'm I'm not good in this in this area. I'm not uh, I you know I, I know my strengths and, and my limitations, and one of my limitations is that I'm not a good uh, theoretical big picture thinker. I'm I'm much more comfortable in the world of of rhetoric and 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 discourse. Um, but we'll say that. Um, Again, it depends on on where you're at, what you have access to. Um, you know, obviously, if, if for somebody who's living in Palestine, uh, it, it's going to look a lot different than than somebody living in the suburbs of of Washington D.C. But as a, as a general rule, steadfastness, um, a refusal to concede, a solitary inch philosophically, morally, or politically to the oppressor, that's critical wherever you're at. Uh, once you see that inch, once you see that millimeter, they're going to keep going and they ain't going to be satisfied until you are fully submitted to their authority. Um, find any groups that are doing work that, that, you think is important or meaningful and join up with them it's the, the, there is not an individual answer to this this kind of question it's it's always a group answer a collective answer i would also suggest um if you're talking about the end of 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 the genocide and of the liberation of of palestine then we all around the world need to think seriously about the question of resistance and on the ground resistance and what type of it we're willing to support and more important, what type of it that we're willing to defend. That's where the lines get get blurry for people for all kinds of reasons, even people who might uh, advocate for a, a certain form of, of, of resistance will be too scared to say it out loud. Again, no judgment. I, I understand why why that is and why that has to be. But at, at some point, we have to force into the discourse a serious reckoning with and a serious conversation about 
Palestinian resistance that goes beyond the silly Orientalist tropes that, that we've heard a million times or about flattened, ridiculous condemnations of Hamas. That, you know, that, that these conversations need, they need to be taken seriously, they need to happen. And so, yeah, resistance and, and liberation, they, they go along multiple tracks, but two of the tracks are, are how they exist in, in, in the discourse and how they exist militarily on the ground. You know, figure out which one you can help and, uh, you know, sort of uh, take it from there. And I'm sorry that I can't give a, a, a better answer, but really that's the best answer that I can give. I appreciate that answer. And, I, you know, I know we're going to be in dialogue and maybe maybe we could have a longer conversation more on that topic at another time. I would love to, to talk about that more um, with you and with other folks, because I think that, um, you know, it is it is such a critical thing. We try to do it in ways that we can here um, because it is very much that, yeah, we, we, I think we do need to engage in this politics of, um, you know, trying to push forward a ceasefire, trying to do what we can in the, especially in the United States and, you know, folks in the West and in UK and, you know, so on to, to, and I mean, everywhere, right. That, you know, is funneling things um, to, to the Zionist entity at this time. Um, but it is also important to not just, you know, excise out the actual resistance, which is ongoing um, from that conversation. Um, and a lot of folks do that, even if it's just, um, you know, sometimes I don't think it's because in certain cases, it's because people have an issue with it, which is kind of what we talked about earlier. Um, in terms of like the the need to condemn Hamas or to say Hamas can't be a part of the picture or whatever. But I think for other folks, it's maybe that's in the back of their mind, but they actually, at least in theory, do support the ability of Palestinians to resist, but are still um, afraid to have those conversations for a variety of reasons that, you know, we do understand, but we have to have them nonetheless. They're important to have. Um appreciate everybody for your comments and engagement in the chat um yeah folks everything that we talked about in terms of uh steve's work is in you know can be found on his website steve um it's been a real honor and a pleasure to have you on here and i do look forward to having more conversations with you um hopefully soon i hope so too thank you uh jared and thank you everybody right on all right now if i can find it yes i can take us out of here with some exit music so uh thanks again everybody